Welcome back, everyone. Up next, I want to talk about another method we can use to help us find the volumes of our solids of revolutions. And so this method is going to be called volume by shells or volume by cylindrical shells. And I want us to look at this example to kind of discover this method together. So in this example, we want to find the volume of the solid that is created by rotating the region bounded by the two functions y equals 2x squared minus x cubed and y equals 0 about the y-axis. So our first step is to visualize our region, and then we're going to decide how exactly we can slice this region up. So let's start by graphing our region of interest, the region bounded by y equals 2x squared minus x cubed and y equals 0. And it might be helpful for us if we recognize that we could factor that as x squared times 2 minus x. That'll help us find the zeros of our function or where it's going to intersect our lower bounding curve. So we're going to have a 0 at x equals 0 and a 0 at x equals positive 2. And so I'm, I'm skipping the steps of showing how I get all the detail of this graph, but essentially the graph is going to look something like this. And so in between these two curves is our region of interest. Now we're going to rotate our region around the y-axis, and that is going to generate our solid object that we are trying to find the volume of. And so now if we try to visualize what the solid is going to look like as we rotate our region around the y-axis, we see that we're going to end up with some kind of curved bowl-like shape with a very flat bottom. So we will find the volume of the solid by using our new shell method. Uh, but before we discuss this new shell method, let's go ahead and try to approach it with our previous disk and washer method to see why that method is going to fail us or at least be really, really hard to use here. And so remember, in general, when you're using the, uh, the disk or washer method, if we want to look at a slice of our solid object to help find the volume of that slice, well, we always make the slice perpendicular to the axis of rotation that we are working with. So here our axis of rotation is the y-axis or a vertical axis of rotation. So the disk or washer method, we want to take a perpendicular slice to our axis of rotation. So that'll be a horizontal slice. So let's go ahead and try to think of what is a horizontal slice of this object going to look like? So here's just what one sample horizontal slice might look like. And we can see the thickness of our slice is going to be some small change in y values, delta y. So we're going to eventually have to integrate with respect to y if we want to use the disk or washer method. And we can see that we have that kind of gap in the middle. So it is going to end up being a washer. And now this is where the washer method gets really, really difficult because if we wanted to use the disk or washer method, we'd have to find the outer radius as well as the inner radius for each of our uh, little segments. And since with the disk or washer method, we would end up integrating with respect to y, that means we have to solve the equation that describes our region for x in terms of y. And that is really, really difficult in this case. We have to basically solve a cubic equation, which can be done, but again, very difficult, not something we are actually going to be interested in doing. So the disk or washer method seems a bit too difficult for this problem. That doesn't mean we're going to give up. Instead, we're going to develop a new approach, the approach that we call volume by shells or volume by cylindrical shells. So one observation that I'd like us to make together that I think will make understanding the concept of the shell method a bit easier is kind of an alternative way of how we created this, uh, this washer in pink that I drew in here. So the way I described obtaining this washer from our solid of interest was, well, first we spun the entire region around our axis of rotation, created the solid, and then took a horizontal slice out of our solid, thought about pulling that slice out and looking at it on its own. And that is one way to view our washer. Another way to think about creating our washer is, well, we talked about finding the area of regions. And while talking about how to find or approximate the area of regions, we talked about using kind of vertical slices or horizontal slices. And the difference that made was integrating with respect to x or y. And we're going to do something kind of similar here for the shell method. So we can think of the washer method as we made a bunch of approximating horizontal strips and approximated those areas with rectangles. Then we rotate each of those horizontal rectangles around our axis of rotation. And that's creating our disk or washer. But we could have also approximated the area of our region using vertical strips, vertical pieces, and vertical rectangles.
So the next step in the process is basically the same as what we were just doing or discussing with the washer method. Instead of taking that horizontal strip and rotating it around our axis of rotation, now we're going to take our vertical strip here, this vertical rectangle, and rotate it around our axis of rotation. And so what happens when we take this horizontal rectangle and rotate it around this vertical Y axis is it doesn't create a disc or a washer. Instead, it creates a hollow cylinder or what we call a cylindrical shell. And so here it is like we have taken our cylindrical shell and pulled it out of our solid object. And this is what our cylindrical shell is going to look like. And so the way we kind of recreated the entire solid object or found the volume of our solid object using the disc or washer method was we stacked all these discs or washers side by side or on top of each other, depending on our order of integration and our perspective. Well, with these cylindrical shells, we're going to do something slightly different. Instead of stacking them on top of each other or side by side, all of our cylindrical shells are going to be interfitting, and we're going to be able to kind of put them inside of each other to recreate our solid object. All right, so maybe let's just draw in a second shell here next to our first one and kind of see how this interfitting stacking would end up uh, occurring. And so let's take a second region. Again, we're using a little vertical strip here. This time I'm going to do it in green so we can really see that difference. And now we're going to take this little vertical approximating rectangle that we could use to help us find the area of our region. But now we're trying to find the volume of our solid. So we're going to rotate this around our axis of rotation. And as we rotate and fill all that space as we rotate, we are creating just a second smaller cylindrical shell that will fit nice and snugly inside of our first blue cylindrical shell. Well, we can do this for all of our vertical approximating rectangles, and that will give us a bunch of these interfitting shells that approximate the solid object we are interested in. And so now the problem turns into, how do we find the volume of these approximating cylindrical shells? Once we know how to do that, we can start using more and more shells, maybe take a limit, our approximation will improve, and so at some point along the way, we'll end up converting this to a definite integral. And so our next task is to figure out how to find the volume of one of our approximating cylindrical shells. And the, the key to kind of figuring out this little volume formula that we're going to use for our cylindrical shells is to actually decompose our cylindrical shell that we have here and try to view it as a simpler shape. And the way we're going to do that is think about kind of making a cut at some point along our cylindrical shell and then unrolling or unfolding our cylindrical shell. And so let's go ahead and think of this rolled up piece of paper as one of our cylindrical shells, right? It's very, very thin because, well, as we use more and more cylindrical shells, they become thinner and thinner and thinner. And so the idea is if we cut along our vertical edge of our cylindrical shell and unroll our cylindrical shell, it turns into a rectangular prism, right? This piece of paper technically has some thickness to it, just like when we unroll our very, very thin shell, it'll also have some thickness to it as well. And the main reason why we are thinking about opening up our cylindrical shell and unrolling it is because as a rectangular prism, it's gonna be much easier to find the volume for, or a formula for the volume, than using some hollow cylindrical shell, right? Because the volume of a rectangular prism is just a product of the length, the width, and the height. So now to find the approximate volume of just one of our cylindrical shells, we have to describe these quantities, the length, the width, and the height of our shell. So let's go ahead and start by finding the length of our rectangular prism. And here I'm describing the length as just this base distance. And what we need to recognize here is that the, the bottom length of the cylindrical shell really comes from unrolling the cylindrical shell, and it corresponds to the original circumference of the cylindrical shell. So after we unroll it, that circumference becomes the length of our cylindrical shell. And how do we find the circumference of something? Well, it's 2 pi times the radius of that something. And well, we should be able to go back to our cylindrical shell and our picture of our region to help us find this radius quantity. We'll probably express that in terms of one of our variables like x or y, depending on how everything ends up getting set up. But here we're actually coming up with this general shell formula. So now we know the length of our rectangular prism, which came from the circumference of our cylindrical shell. 
we're actually going to do the, the width last. Let's go ahead and jump up to the height next. Well, how tall is our rectangular prism? The height of our rectangular prism is actually going to be exactly the same as the height of our cylindrical shell. So how do we find the height of our cylindrical shell? Well, we can go back to our region here and we can see that the height of each of one of these uh, shells is just going to come from the height of that corresponding approximating rectangle. And while the height of all these rectangles or shells are just coming from the value of the function that creates the top of our region. And so we know the equation for our function, but let's just leave it in general. Let's just call it h for now for height, knowing that the height is just going to be the output of our function f of x. It's going to be beneficial to leave this general shell formula in terms of h and r, because we may end up working with respect to x or y, in which case we might need to change these things around a little bit. So we found the length of our rectangular prism coming from the circumference of our cylindrical shell. We found the height of our rectangular prism, which comes from the height of our cylindrical shell and the value of our original function that creates our bounded region. The last thing we need is the width of our rectangular prism, which is going to be the same as the width of our shell. Well, what is the width of our shell going to be? Well, this is going to depend on if we're using a vertical approximating strip or a horizontal approximating strip, similar to how we figure that out with the disk or washer method. And well, in this setup, it looks like we are going to be using a vertical strip with a small thickness in the x direction. So that'd end up being a delta x. But for our general formula, we're just going to leave that as delta r. It's actually some small change in the radii between the kind of inner cylinder and the outer cylinder. All right, this general volume formula for a cylindrical shell is going to be really important to remember and keep off to the side because it's going to be what we revisit for each of these problems where we try to find a volume using the shell method. And so now let's uh, be less general with this formula and start making it work for our specific example. So in our example, what is the volume of just one of our approximating shells going to be? Let's maybe kind of focus on this blue one as our reference point. Well, it's going to be 2 pi times the radius of that shell. So what is the radius of the shell? The radius of our shell is just going to be the distance from the axis of rotation to our shell itself, or in this case, to our approximating rectangle. So I said we're using that blue rectangle as our reference for the setup. And so our radius is that horizontal distance from the axis of rotation to the shell itself. And well, this horizontal distance is going to be described by the x value that corresponds to our shell or our approximating rectangle. So our radius value is just x. It has to be x because it's going to vary as we move throughout our region and use these different approximating rectangles. So the next thing we need to find in our formula is the height of our cylindrical shell. And well, the height of our cylindrical shell is going to come from the height of our approximating rectangle, which is just going to be given by the output of our function at the corresponding input. And so the height of our cylindrical shell is just going to be given by 2x squared minus x cubed. This will also be a function of x, or we can think of that as a function of the radius, because as we move farther and farther away from our axis of rotation, we're going to have these varying approximating rectangles with varying heights and varying distances from our axis of rotation. And so now to finish setting this uh, shell volume up, we have to find the thickness of our cylindrical shell for this problem. And well, the thickness of our shell is just going to be that small change in the radius values, which is some small change in x values. So that'll be a delta x for the radius. And I actually did this problem a little bit backwards for our first example, just kind of going from left to right. Most of the time, what I actually start with finding is when I'm referencing this volume of a shell formula, I first find the thickness delta r, because that'll tell me how I'm going to set or write everything else up. Right? So what I mean by that is we recognize that our thickness is a delta x, some small change in x values or horizontal values. So that means we're going to want to express all these other quantities, like the height and the radius, in terms of x. It's basically telling us what we're going to integrate with respect to eventually, and that's going to be x. But we are not quite ready to integrate yet, because, well, what we have right here is really just the volume for one of our shells. 
right? It would take the volume of this blue shell, add it to the volume of this green shell, as well as create a bunch of other shells and add all their volumes together. But now we have a quick way of finding the volume of each of those shells. So if we wanted to actually approximate the volume of our solid object itself, well, what we do is we take the sum of all of these volumes of these approximating shells. So we'll be taking the sum of the volume of all these approximating shells, add those together, and that'll give us the approximate volume of our solid object of interest. And so let's say we're using n shells to begin with. That'll give us an approximation, and we'll talk about improving our approximation in just a second. So we're going to have to add up 2 pi xi times 2x squared i minus x cubed i times delta x. And so the terms in our sum are just describing the volumes of each of our approximating shells. And if we add all those volumes up, we get an approximation for the volume of our solid object. But we want something a little bit better than approximation. So if we use more and more shells and make them thinner and thinner, and we do that by taking the limit as n approaches infinity here, well, we go from approximating the volume to find the exact volume, and that's going to give us a definite integral. Right, we have all the components we need here inside our little Riemann sum to create a definite integral. So we're going to end up integrating over the interval of x values from 0 to 2. And then our integrand is just going to basically be this function that we see as the term of each of our sums. So we'll have 2 pi x times 2x squared minus x cubed. And then as we take the limit, our differential of x and so now this integral is going to represent the volume of our solid object. Remember when we were first looking at this example, we were thinking about using the disk or washer method and how to take these horizontal slices. And we stopped pretty quickly because, well, trying to find an expression for the outer and inner radius as a function of y was going to be very, very difficult. But now that we've gone through the process of the shell method, we saw that once we kind of figured the method out, it wasn't too difficult to set up. We just had to find like the radius, the height, and the thickness of the shells, and then set up our definite integral. And if we look at the definite integral that we ended up with, it's much, much easier to evaluate. Once we expand it, we'll actually be able to evaluate it just using the power rule. Because this integral is relatively straightforward to evaluate and I'm running low on board space, I'm not going to take the time to write out all the steps of evaluating our integral on this board, uh, but we should end up with the answer as 16 pi over 5. So go ahead, maybe pause the video, take a second to work this integral out, and you should find that it's equal to exactly 16 pi over 5. That is the exact volume of our solid object.